Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome back to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 45 with Jay Farber. Jay, of course, is best known for finishing runner-up to Ryan Reese in the World Series of Poker main event, earning $5.2 million. Although he was pretty much an unknown at the time in the poker world, Jay had some high-profile people on his rail, including Ben Lamb, Sean Deeb, and the stroked beard of one Dan Bilzerian. It's now been five years since, and Jay is coming off of another good summer. In late June, he took third in a $1,500 bounty event at the WSOP for 121 k and then in July, he finished fifth in our Card Player Poker Tour $5,000 main event at the Venetian for another 134000 But the truth is, Jay doesn't really play much poker these days. In fact, he considers himself retired outside of the occasional high-stakes cash game, which sounds like a pretty awesome life for a 33-year-old. This was a fun interview that kind of went all over the place. You'll hear about Jay's career in the nightclub and bar industry. You'll hear about high-stakes cash games and uh, huge blackjack sessions. And you'll also hear about the giant cephalopods that are poised to take over the world. That's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Jay Farber. I'm here with the one and only Jay Farber. Jay, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, you know, coming off of a pretty good summer. Yeah. Right? Not bad. Not bad for a guy who doesn't really like poker very much, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is true for a non-professional poker player. It's a good That's time. right. I wanted to get into, uh, I guess, what you define yourself as. What's what's the what's the employment status these days? I don't know. I just tell people I'm retired. <laughs> retired? That's a pretty uh, good gig to have at, what, 34? 33. I'll be 34 30. next in three weeks. So. Happy birthday. Thank you. Come up. Yeah, so uh, how are you feeling these days? Good, man. About your game, about life, everything. Uh, everything's good. Uh, yeah. My game has gotten better. I, you know, put in some hours in the lab, and um, it's paid off on the felt. And uh, life is good. I have a pretty simple life, just hang out and train. Yeah. And What do you mean by lab? Uh, I was what, in, what is the lab? <laughs> li- literally the, the poker lab, upswing lab, actually. But there you just, go. Um, just researching a lot of poker videos and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I have a lot of free time, so I don't have an excuse to not get better at the things I like to do. <laughs> um, one of my commitments to myself sort of in the last couple of years has been to spend as much time, or at least partly as much time, uh, getting better at poker as I am with other things in my life, sort of trying to find that balance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it's been really helpful. So not and, just going to play poker, but mm-hmm. the behind-the-scenes stuff. Of, yeah, putting in, putting in the actual work that all yeah. these best guys in the world are doing. I mean, I'm not nearly on their level, and I'm not putting in the type of work they are, but if I'm going to play, I might as well try to keep yeah. up. You know, and now the the availability of the information, you know, the high-level information that's out there is – is so plentiful. Like when I started playing poker, it was there were three books out, and yeah. <laughs> you were you had to figure it out on your own. Now you got so much, so much knowledge that other people are sharing that you you're doing yourself a disservice if you want to be a poker player and you're not put in the hours on the internet. You know whether it's CLC, Upswing, whatever Card Runner, whatever the you know any mm-hmm. of these training sites that are available to you, or even just the free videos on YouTube. Like yeah, go watch them. Have you thought? Have you compared the Jay Farber poker player of 2013 who finished second in the main event to today's? Um, How much better are you than that Jay Farber? I'm probably quite a bit better. Um, Because I doubt you were were this uh, mathematically approaching the game back then, right? I still don't really approach the game mathematically. I just kind of played the poker that I wanted to play and, Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I wasn't, I'm much more aware of my image now than I was then. I mean, I was still aware of it, but mm-hmm. um, just my approach to strategy and three betting and four betting and things like that has, has gotten a lot better and you can see it pay dividends uh, 
in every aspect of the game, really. And yeah. You know, well, so. let's go get back to poker. I want to go back to the mm-hmm. beginning, um, thirty three, almost thirty four years ago. Santa Barbara, California. Uh, I was born in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh, uh, quite a ways away from Santa Barbara. Quite a ways away. My family moved to Santa Barbara when I was two, two and a half years old. Um, okay. And that's where I grew up. I, I'm going to call you a California kid. <laughs> call me whatever you want. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Well, how uh, was Santa Barbara like? What was the family like? What were you guys getting into? Um, I mean, Santa Barbara's a small town, so I was just... It's uh, family life was good. My my parents divorced when I was um, like three years old, so mm-hmm. I lived with my dad. Um, got in all the usual trouble. I grew up in a pool hall, which is where I picked up basically all of my bad habits, which <laughs> carry over to today. What um, was this pool hall? Just like your dad's place? Or no, like it was uh, it was uh, down the street from the comic book store that I played Magic and all these <laughs> card games at. So <laughs> we'd go there and play video games. You know, they had Marvel vs. Capcom and like all the Street Fighter and all that. So we would yeah. just do that and play pool and gamble on everything and then so even I, back then as a kid yeah it I mean, wasn't just I, enough to play for glory no never <laughs> i mean who you know, who's gonna say no to playing for money when you so have how, how do you right? think that started like was it just the group you were hanging out with yeah or? i think just the group i was hanging out with mm-hmm. and you know i i don't know i was like rounders came out right 96 right yeah Let, let's you know i have the internet in front of me let's use it yeah rounders Oh, there's a Rounders Grill and Pub here in Vegas. That doesn't help. Rounders movie. We'll go with the one with Matt Damon. <laughs> 1998. 98. Okay, yeah. so I was 14 years old, you know, right around that time where we were all playing pool, gambling, video games, everything, and Rounders came out, so we all wanted to play Texas Hold'em. Yeah. Um, so, so that it, so that got to you as a teenager. Because that's funny because I did, had no awareness of Rounders in 1998. It wasn't until the poker boom came that I revisited the movie. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't – I mean – I think everybody that I was with watched it, and they're like, we're going to play. And then we just had a game going, whether it was in the pool hall or, like, out back, and we'd set up a table or something like that and just Mm -hmm. play. And then from What was, like, little Jay Farber like at the time? Was he – I was a spoiled shit. I mean – What does that mean? like I am now. I don't know. I just (laughs) – little Jay Farber was the asshole that I've been my entire life. Was he an athlete? Was he on all the sports teams? Was he the nerd in school? Was Um, he on the choir? (laughs) More of the nerd, I think. I I, I still played sports. I did – not like team sports, but yeah. uh, combat sports, and I did karate and kickboxing and all that. And yeah. uh, I played cards, man. I played good magic. I, uh, yeah, uh, it was my big, th- my dad's big thing for me was to be a good student. That was so his. So that's why you had free reign elsewhere because you were irresponsible in the classroom. Relatively, yeah. yeah. Uh, that that ended in like high school when I just decided <laughs> that I didn't, I wasn't gonna follow my dad's path. I guess. Yeah. Well, what um, did he do? My dad was the first in his family to go to college, uh, went to Andover and then Harvard, um, graduated from both, like, top of his class. And That's a lot so of that, pressure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot to live up to, but that was his outlet from, you know, that was his key to success was his yeah. education. And, it's you know, it obviously did really well for him, and I think it's certainly an important aspect of life to get an education. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had other things I enjoyed more at the time. Yeah, you, you were know? in the pool hall. Yeah, I was in the pool Texas hall. I was gambling. I was, I was doing all the things that you're probably not supposed to be doing as a kid. And, um, <laughs> Did you ever get into any big trouble? A little bit here and there. Yeah. yeah. You know. Is this typical? This up? <laughs> I, fuck, I hope not. <laughs> I think that record's been sealed long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, is part of the thing of growing up is you get into trouble and you, you fuck around and you yeah. do stupid shit and, I did all that, um, but I was definitely more of the nerd. Um, but I think you know, playing the card games, playing—I I played like every card game as a kid. You know, Magic, Star Trek, Highlander, fucking Pokemon, like yeah. all of that shit, because that's what all my friends were doing. Um, did you feel like you had a knack for it? Were you better uh, than your friends at, at cards, or I don't know, maybe I think I just played more. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think part of poker is getting in the hands and. You know, well, I talk to poker players all the time, and a lot of times you can see they have the same through line as their in their childhood. Mm-hmm. Magic is a big one, obviously. A lot of poker players come from the magic background. But with one thing I notice in poker players is that they learn early on that they're just better at games than most people. Um, I mean, maybe. I I think it's a certain type of brain. You're just sort of yeah. more analytical enough if, if that's what you take to as a kid. Like, I, I mean, I started out with Legos, and then I started playing chess. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just training your mind to think in a certain way, which is thinking ahead of your opponent. 
and that's part of what poker is is just analyzing every decision and that's what magic is that's what you know all these card games are built around critical yeah. thinking so if you start developing those skills at an early age you just manifest them later in life so when poker came around what what stakes are we talking are you cleaning out lunch money or how was it working it eventually turned into pretty big games you know yeah. we were playing you know like one dollar two dollar no limit wow. yeah, as a kid is is pretty big you know um that's, then, that's, you know, that's the bottom level of the casino, not the home game level. Yeah, know? well, we had some interesting friends that we played the home games with. <laughs> um, lots of questionable professions find their way into the pool hall, so you uh, you mean, you definitely get to uh, meet some interesting people and play some yeah. interesting games. Um, and then I started, you know, sneaking into the, the Match Casino when I was, like, 15 years old playing there had a fake id had my buddy's id <laughs> uh, i was coming to vegas when i was like 17 18 playing years just old. poker or anything everything yeah I mean, yeah i found blackjack and all that pretty early in life um it's one of the major leaks in my financial game that i've tried to eliminate over the last <laughs> few years so you're a losing blackjack player i don't think i'm a losing blackjack player i was actually a winning blackjack player for a long time mm-hmm. and then after 2013 the money mattered very much less. Got it. So uh, then, yeah, so it wasn't enough to win like four thousand bucks, right? I wanted yeah. to win a hundred thousand, and you, you're either going to put up a lot of money to win a hundred thousand, <laughs> or you're going to chase. And exactly. I ended up getting drunk and chasing a lot, and I think I have it probably under control now. I haven't. I've played like one table game session this year. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah it doesn't seem like too much of a problem if you can keep it to one a year. Yeah, I mean, it used to be a problem. If, if you <laughs> don't recognize it's a problem, then you get in trouble. So you're in high school. You're gambling. Yep. You finished high school? Did finish high school. And then what's the plan? Uh, I went to City College for a while. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't really have a plan. I was just doing the opposite of what my father wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just trying to figure it out. I was business admin major, gambling, uh, partying a lot. Did you have any idea? Like, were you like, maybe I'll do this? Or you had no leanings whatsoever? Mm, not really. No, I, you know, once I... I was just hanging out with a good group of people. Once I was like 18, 19, 20 years old, I turned 21, started coming to Vegas like pretty often. Yeah, now um, you don't have to sneak around with yeah. a fake mustache. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and I started playing poker out here. You know, I, I always had poker as a as a thing, and mm-hmm. I started coming out to Vegas like every other weekend. I wasn't doing so anything. I was a, working was in like bars. Oh, six. Um, 07? Yeah, like 2005, 2006. Yeah. Um, well, that's right. You were underage before. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was doing the well, I, 21. And I was like, oh, that's right. You yeah. weren't doing it. I was born 1984, so. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Go team 1984. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I was coming out here. I was working in a bar doing security as a bouncer, and um, it was fun. But Is, Was you that know. your first introduction into the nightclub life? And Yeah. Yeah, I, were, I started working. Um, How did you get that gig? Were you as big back then? Yeah, I, I was probably bigger. I was... Uh, all I did, I mean, I didn't really have a lot of responsibilities and poker took care of my bills when I was, mm-hmm. or gambling was taking care of any bills I might have. And um, I was working out all the time and I turned 21 and I'm like, I like being around nightclub or I like being in the bar scene. Yeah. So I, I started working like private security gigs for a company through a buddy I met. And then that's sort of- here. This was in, this was back home in Santa Barbara. Oh, okay. So you hadn't um, moved out here. Hadn't moved out here yet. So uh, I was working at- doing the private security stuff and that transitioned into bar gigs and I had a ton of free time. So I was just come out to Vegas back and forth, back and forth. And everybody asked me like, you're in Vegas so much. Why don't you just move there? And I always had some excuse. And, uh, after Especially a couple years, the nightclub game, right? Well, yeah. If, it, I, after, I can't imagine Santa Barbara compares. <laughs> no, it's, Although it's totally in my different. Mind, it's Santa Barbara down. is just what I saw on the show psych. So I have no idea what it's like. I don't think I've ever seen it in, <laughs> portrayed in psych. I don't even know if it was filmed in Santa Barbara. In psych. I doubt it was filmed. There. <laughs> um, I was just coming back and forth and everybody was like, why don't you just move to Vegas? I always had an excuse and I ran out mm-hmm. of excuses. Yeah. So I, uh, through my partying, I'd met a lot of people at the Hard Rock, and I asked the director of promotions for the Hard Rock, I'm like, hey, look, I want to move out here. Uh, I'm probably going to play a lot of poker because it's what I'm good at, but I want to have a safety net. I want to have a job. And That already makes you more responsible than 80% of all poker players who come out here. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it didn't, you know, it, I don't know. The fact that you <laughs> even sought a safety net. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I kept the safety net. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> so I ended up, you know, I'm like, hey, look, I want to come out. I want to have a job just in case. You know, I want to have playing poker and having it as your only source of income is 
really fucking stressful. Yeah. Really, really stressful. Because I remember when I was in between jobs, um, my rent was due and I like didn't have any money. So I had to put in a 30 hour poker session. I'm like, if I don't win, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Yeah. So, uh, I ended up winning and I, I paid my rent and like paid extra and I was like, all right. Like how, how many back against the wall moments did you have like that in my life? Um, fuck, I can think of like three yeah. offhand. Um, it's the worst feeling, right? Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> but uh, you know, they say you're not, not a true hustler if you can't lose it all and get it back. Right. Yeah. Um, so I got the job. I actually did really, I, I lived with three other promoters for the hard rock. They showed me the ropes, um, started doing really well. You know, I, I slid in at a, at the a great time in nightlife to be involved in the scene. Um, and then it yeah, just kind of kinda... like Vegas was doing the shift from, okay, we don't make our money gambling anymore here. We make it on millennials and bottle service. Yeah. Know? I mean, I, I was working at the hard rock during the highlight of the rehab party. Um, they had the reality show. It was it was the biggest time as far as the burgeoning of nightlife goes. Yeah. Um, and I was right in the middle of it, so I found myself not. Yeah, I have some great nightclub stories. I mean, I'm sure I have a I have a can ton. You, can you share some? One. Uh, Just crazy things you saw. You know. I mean, I've seen everything. Like anything that you can like every story that you've ever heard about happening in Vegas, it happens. And it's true. Yeah, it happens all the time. It's it, yeah. it's all a blur at this point. Like, I was I've been involved in nightlife in Vegas for ten years. So that's right. Because you you it's not like you're just sitting at the door, you know, with your no, arms crossed waiting. You're in this party. Oh, being a, being a promoter was the best job. It's much different now, but being a promoter when I started was the best job that you could mm-hmm. ever have in Vegas. And I didn't realize it at the time. I wanted the prestige. I wanted to be a host. I wanted to you know move up. But being a promoter, you got paid per head on everybody you brought in the club. You had to have a certain amount of ratio, guys to girls. Guest list was open until midnight. After midnight, we yeah. got to party. So <laughs> as soon as shift was up, boom, boom, drink tickets. We're going down in a club. We're drinking, trying to hang out with as many girls as possible because, yeah. like, that's my meal ticket for the next day, right? Like, talk to every girl in the club. Oh, who got you in? Nobody? Okay, well, where, where are you going tomorrow? Let me take care of you. Let me set you up. Like, We got to give – I mean, they give it away now, but, like, this was when it was new – giving away free dinners, you know, to these girls. Like, oh, I'm going to this club tomorrow night. Why don't you come with me? It was the... So you're the man. Yeah, you got to be the man. And, I mean, you weren't the man to your coworkers. You were a fucking peon, you know. (laughs) If you were a promoter, you were the bottom of the totem pole. And it's probably like that now. Yeah. But I was making great money. The girls don't need to know that. Yeah, they don't need to know that. (laughs) As far as they knew, I'm the man. But I was making great money and had no responsibilities. Like, that was it. Just show up, work for two hours, and party. Yeah. And we drink for free and party for free, go everywhere for free. Like living, working nightlife in Vegas, if you have your vices under control, is one of the coolest jobs you could possibly have as a 20 something year old kid. And what's, and how realistic is it to have your vices under control when you're up till four in the morning every night? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I did okay. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 there's a lot of people that can get it done and there's a lot of people that can't. Yeah. You know, the city will chew you up and spit you out if you don't have your shit under control because. Everything that you want to do is available to you 24-7. <laughs> it's a very convenient city. Yeah. 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 It's a fun city. All right. So you're working, uh, promoting. What happens there? Uh, I did really well as a promoter. I was making a ton of money and making a lot of money for other people. And I started booking tables, you know, part of where I would get my this clients. This was all over? Like you had a different uh, club every night? Or no, I was work? at the Hard Rock. I worked for the Hard Rock. Okay. I worked for Body English and Rehab. That was my thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know... Um, part of promoting is networking you meet because if somebody else has got a a group in town and they can take nobody wants to go to the same club three nights in a row or whatever it is so you send them to somebody else they send you people you reciprocate um and you had this spider web network yeah i was slowly building it up you know i i made a habit of finding out who the most important people were at every venue and introducing myself and being like hey look let's do business together like help me make some money for you and vice versa um, and it, it was working out. Uh, I got promoted to host and then my life went downhill. I didn't have time to play poker. Uh, being a host is, it was a lot of fun, but it's a very different job. Like it's you, more money, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's definitely more prestige. If you, if that's the thing like you're looking for, it's more responsibility. You got office hours, you got visitations, you got to, it's not about just bringing in, um, 
people, bodies to the club. Now you got to bring in bodies who are spending money. Right, you're looking for whales. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, I mean, I'm not even not even whales. Like, I, starting out, you're you're really lucky if you're going to meet somebody who's going to spend a thousand bucks. Like, all the people who spend real money most of the time already know your boss. Yeah. You know, so you got to go out there and you got to find those guys. And luckily for me, when I had the time, I could play poker, and I was playing like two five, five ten, whatever, and. Poker's Getting a better, sword. building a role. Uh, I mean, not even that. Just playing to play, making some money here and there. But poker's a social game. So if somebody would win a couple thousand bucks, you, you know, you're talking like, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, oh, well, I work <laughs> at this club. Like, let me know if you want me to get you a table set up or wherever. Like, it's what I do. Like, and That's great. That, so I had a built-in clientele base that I would win money from and also profit from on the on the side. So it was working out pretty well. Like, poker treated me really well. Uh being at the Hard Rock was great. I met Dan Fleischman, and uh, Fleischman introduced me to a ton of people. He sort of kickstarted um, a lot of my career. He's responsible for meeting a ton of people, yeah. especially in the poker industry. I mean, I met Dan Bilzerian through him. Uh, you know, a lot of big name poker players, and then a lot of people with a lot of money. You know, who would who Dan knew because he was always just involved in something, and I was his guy through the Victory Poker launch party at the Hard Rock for them, uh, and that sort of. You know, I don't want to say put me on the map, but it, it helped a lot as yeah. far as getting me out there as somebody that like, people can go to. Yeah. Um, so now you become the go-to guy. I don't know if I was the go-to guy. I was definitely – I think I was the go-to guy in the poker world for people who didn't know. Like if you knew Jason Strauss because you were Antonio Sfondiari, you're, you're always going to go through Jason Strauss or whatever. But, you know, a lot of the guys that didn't have somebody in poker, like I was their guy for okay. sure. So what happened? Um. I don't know. I still, I mean, I carried it on, and then 2013 happened, basically. That's what I'm saying. 2013, I mean, what was the what was the plan? You were going to play the main event, or uh, Dan was, uh, was just like, here, Dan, play the main event? Uh, no, I was playing the main. Uh, mm-hmm. I had satellited in anyway, but I just, I was selling pieces. Um, yeah. Gave Dan so, like, 20. T- in 2013, mm-hmm. what was your bankroll like? What games were you playing? You know, what, because you mentioned you, when you were the host, you weren't playing as much. Yeah, I wasn't playing as much. Um, luckily, by 2013, I was uh, working independently, so I wasn't. I went from the Hard Rock to Angel Man. Well, I went from the Hard Rock to Encore Beach and Surrender. I didn't last very long there. Um, my old boss, Larry Murphy, great guy. We don't work well together. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love him. Like, we hang out. If we see each other, it's, it's all love, but personalities clash, so we didn't do well. Um, Did start, you like the beach clubs better than the nightclubs? No, I was, I've, I've always been a nightclub guy. Okay. I've always been a night owl. So, like, being out at night, being out till 5, 6 in the morning never bothered me. And I think as a young kid, brutal. like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it was the worst. I used to live in Henderson. I'd drive home racing the sun. I was oh. just, like, <laughs> driving straight into it, like, fuck. <laughs> um, so I, I went back to working for Angel Management Group at the time, which is now Hakkasan Group. I worked uh, as host manager for LAX, and then I was working at Rehab and What Republic. And you I got around. Yeah, I got around. I don't do well in a corporate setting. I don't like having bosses. I'm just, I don't know. Yeah. Just, uh, so that didn't last very long, and then I became an independent host. I was very lucky in that I had good clientele, a consistent clientele. Yeah. It was all over the 2 plus 2 forum, which really helped a lot until they <laughs> banned me. Um, but you know, that, of honor. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's sort of how I maintain my name in the poker as far as nightlife poker industry is concerned mm-hmm. and just got a lot of business through that and a lot of referral business. Um, the, most of nightlife and business in general is all about providing a good service and getting referrals. So thankfully I had a core group of clientele that would come in like three, four times a year, whatever it was. Um, and they take good care of me. Uh, I don't know what my poker bankroll was like, but I was, I would play 5, 10, 10, 20, whatever the game was. Like I was a 5, 10 reg at the win back in the day when the win game was uncapped. uncapped. And Man, that was a game was crazy. Yeah. I mean, you could play one, three at the win back in the day and somebody yeah. would be sitting there with 25,000 on the table. Yeah. That was the best. Those were the best games because two people would always just stumble over from the Baccarat room, be like, what's going on here? And drop down 20 K and lose or whatever. Um, that's one of the things I look for in a poker room in, on on the strip. How open is the room to the other games? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like Caesars mm-hmm. used to have that room in the corner, mm-hmm. and it was very quiet, yeah. smoke free, yeah. lots of space, and full of rocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, no one has ever nobody who's playing Bach rock could just come in and b- blow no, money. That's why Aria and the Win 
or the yeah. best rooms for the casual person to stroll. And Bellagio is pretty good about that too, I guess, yeah. but I don't play at the Bellagio. So did they ban you too? No, no. <laughs> if I, I, I would be banned from all MGM properties. That would suck. Yeah. Like, 2013. Let's see. You were you were 28. 28 years old. 28 years old. At, at this point, before the main event, are you thinking to yourself, how long can I work in nightlife? Or, you know, you don't mm. want to be the 70 year old guy or whatever doing it. No, I don't think that's. Um, I really like what I was doing in nightlife at the time. I, I had no boss, no schedule, and the same core group of clients come in and all the time. So I was taking care of the right people. Yeah. And, um, and I was just, and I was playing poker. I had as much time as I wanted to play poker. So I was pretty happy with the way everything was going in my life. So you win a satellite, then you're like, let's sell a few pieces here and there. Yeah, I was playing. Well, I was I was going to play anyway, and then I just satellited it because um, why not take a shot to win 10K? Yeah. Right? And the mega satellites are so soft. Yeah. <laughs> to this day, they're still soft. <laughs> uh, and so I got in and I sold pieces to a bunch of my friends, clients, whatever, um, people I've known Most forever. famous, I guess, was Sean Deeb and Dan Bilzerian. Yeah, Dan, Ben Lamb. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, those are the three big ones. These are some names. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that I had, a, I had, had a pretty, faith in you. Yeah, I had a pretty good rail. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and then just managed to run like God for seven days. Yeah, do you feel like you ran like God? or? I definitely ran really well. I mean, I got I got slapped in the face with a deck a lot, but I also got paid a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Part of being aware of your image is knowing that, like, I'm going to get value. I will get and three then streets. And goes full circle because you were talking about that earlier. Like, what is it about your image? Like, describe what you think people see you as. I mean, I look like the type of person who is going to play super aggressive, try and win every pot, and bluff you on every street. Um, okay, I'm aware of that, and mm-hmm. it's so I. You think it's the you think it's the the tattoos? Yeah, it's the tattoos, the, the muscle, gigantic and, arms. Yeah, yeah, just being Asian. The MMA yeah. sh- uh, hat that you're wearing. Yeah, no, I didn't have this back in the day. <laughs> Um, it was the Hakkasan hat back in the day. Uh, yeah, but who knows what that means? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just an H and a K. Nobody knew. Um, so yeah, yeah so, so I was always getting value. I mean, you I, could basically bet home runs on the river with your with your strong hands and get paid. Yeah, and I just wouldn't bluff. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I got there a lot. Yeah, that yeah, that uh, strategy works when you're making hands. Yeah, not when your card dead. But well, also like the main event's so different than playing in a fifteen hundred or a one K, right? You always you know, unless you get cooler, you're almost always going to have chips. And the way I was, I've been a cash game player, so I'm used to playing yeah. 100, 200, 300 big blinds deep and being able to see a lot of flops, play post flop. Uh, part of, I think, what I do well is knowing where I'm at uh, a lot of the times in hands yeah. and understanding, you know, with the strength of my opponents versus mine. Uh, a lot of people are just unaware and they're playing pure math. And like, I understand, like, playing GTO is great. But sometimes you just have to know, like, this person's never bluffing here or yeah. whatever. Um, Every once in a while, somebody's so obviously shaking that you could ignore the math. Right. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, Do you remember a particular hand that stands out to you during the main event? Is there one that you think back on um, often or that comes up when you're playing cards? And you're like, this is just like that spot. Um, not particularly. I mean, Noah Schwartz always gives me shit for aces versus kings on day six. Um <laughs> You know, ace ten versus nines on day seven was a big one. There was one I got to play with Doyle on day two and day four, and I remember a guy like check raise jamming. I flopped the nuts, turned still the nuts, and on the river I still had the nuts. And this guy like check raises the flop, bet in, and then check raise jammed the river when I set the stone nuts <laughs> like a monster pot. And I was like, well, all right, I call. <laughs> <laughs> so there were spots like that where yeah, people were just like people, giving you yeah, people, people really like to give me chips. What about your face? They just like yeah, didn't, yeah. didn't believe you, yeah, I guess. Real, so. real punchable, I guess, or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, know if I'd want to punch your face. Yeah. Yeah, you seem like you hit back hard. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, okay, so, you know, obviously finished second. What was your preparation going into the final table? Partying. Partying, yeah. right? You, it wasn't like you were out there doing research on all your opponents. Because let's be honest, you had a... I mean, I don't know if I don't know if I want to say that you were the most under the radar player at the final table. Oh, I was a hundred percent the most under the radar player at the final table. If I, not, I didn't play any tournaments. I'm if not, not if number I'm, one, number two, or three. Because I mean, that was a crazy final table. We had, you know, J.C. Tran was there, David Benefield, Mark Newhouse was doing his thing, and everyone yeah, was Sylvan Loosely, um, everybody, Amir, like everybody, yeah, Amir, Ryan Reese, obviously, yeah, everybody was a pro, but me. 
Yeah. And you just had Mr. Beard on the on the rail. <laughs> and everyone was like, what's going on there? Yeah. So, like, what? Looking back, do you you know have any regrets? Any regrets about the way anything went down? Or no, I'm I'm, I mean, maybe I would have liked to have won, but uh, I think that if I had overthought the situation, and uh, I probably would have gotten my own head and not played the way I did. And yeah, I just went out there to have a good time and play poker, and I, I don't, I couldn't have run any better. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I definitely could have run better heads up, but I couldn't have run any better on the lead up to heads up and. You know, Ryan played great. Uh, I still have not watched any of our Heads Up match. I've only seen, like, really? some highlighted hands that people have showed me. Is this, like, uh, PTSD or? No, I just, just I don't interested. watch poker. Yeah. I, I mean, I watch, now I'll watch some high-stakes cash game stuff because, like, those are people that I see every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I don't tend to watch a lot of poker, and I never had any interest in seeing, like, me get beat. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, from what I understand, you just always had it, and it's hard to win when they always have it. $5.174 million, obviously. You had to give some of that back to your investors. Mm-hmm. But obviously life-changing money. Uh, a lot of poker players, when they win life-changing money, they go buy into high rollers. You actually did fun things with your money. <laughs> yeah, it seems like way better than trying right? to beat the best players in the world, especially oh when you gosh. know you're not one of them. I mean, I we, we try to do... Uh, <laughs> we tried to do a segment in the magazine, not a segment, uh, a series in the magazine where we asked poker players, hey, remember that big score you had? What would you do with the money, right? And, uh, you know, just don't tell us what you do with the money. Don't tell me taxes, but tell me what fun thing you bought. That was the premise of the article. Mm-hmm. I got back like four good ones. Everyone else was like, all of it went to makeup or I lost it all the next week in in a tournament or I played a high roller I shouldn't have or paid off my debts or whatever, mm-hmm. like... You bought what did you what did you buy? Like I bought a house, I bought some cars, I partied a lot. <laughs> I, I went on basically a year long party. Yeah. Um Yeah, that was it. I mean and people people who look at your tournament resume, I mean you have seven tournament or eight tournament caches, I think. Now? I don't know. Yeah, yeah but I mean You don't play let's it's call not it, like we'll, you we'll call it two. And, yeah. You know, two. It's not like you jump all. on the tour immediately after doing this and like, no, you enjoyed yourself. Yeah. I mean, and I, I hated tournament poker for a long time. It's yeah. just, it, as a cash game player, it's a very different style. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wasn't into it. I still, it's not my favorite. I'd rather play cash any mm-hmm. day now. But uh, I figure if I'm going to be around, I'm going to be try to be good at it. So you so, buy yourself a house. Bought a house, bought some cars. Did you do the Aston Martin? I didn't do the Aston Martin. Okay. I ended they, up they buying. considering it? I bought the new Corvette. I uh, bought a Mercedes E63 AMG. I bought a truck. You um, love cars. Yeah. I, I like toys, man. Yeah. It's always something. Um, got rid of all those, and, you know, now I, I live a slightly simpler life. I only have one car. <laughs> only for now. one car. For now, yeah. Yeah, for now. Do you tinker with cars, or are you just like... I just like them. Yeah. Uh, like I mean, I would uh, always fix them up that, that, that's the biggest money pit in the world is right. once you start down that path like trucks is the worst I, I got the raptor and like i went full on off road off the deep end mm-hmm. and you'll never like <laughs> you'll never spend money on your car like you would on your truck and your off-road toys well you're having fun yeah, yeah I uh, what else i you know there was obviously uh mma came into your life right um that's relatively recent i mean i think two and a half years now i've been doing jujitsu um, yeah I think it's helped me a lot as a person, uh, and it's definitely helped me in poker. Uh, be a lot calmer uh, overall, and then you know, playing poker, you take a bad beat. I'm still not a great loser, um, but you know, I try and think about it like, oh yeah, that, like I just had somebody try and strangle me. To, you know, not not to death, but it's you know, we get out there and you're simulating murder. Essentially, is the joke. Uh, I'm like, how bad is everything else compared to that? It's right. Not, it's really What's not. a bad beat when you almost yeah, out of yeah, oxygen. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Could have had my arm broken. My friend, by the way, was trying to break my arm. Yeah. You know? um, and I just took a bad beat on the felt. Oh, well, fucking move on, you know? Well, getting into the into how good of a fighter are you? Can you can you roll? Can you, what is that, the I, grapple? What is the? Yeah, I'm about to get my – I should get my purple belt before the end of the year, which mm-hmm. is uh, – I mean, means I can – I'm okay. You know, what you learn every day in jiu-jitsu is there's always somebody better. Yeah. Right. Uh, Do you have any uh, ambition to be in a real fight? 
No, not anymore. You're not like gonna be like Terrence Chan out there trying to. No, I fought career. enough as a kid that I don't need to fight as an adult. You, that's part of the thing is, you know, especially getting out there and actually doing it. You mm-hmm. know, like when you're 18, 19, 20 years old and you're fighting, you don't even think about any of the consequences or whatever. Um, when you get a little older, you start to think about the consequences, and now you see it all day. Like I, I look at news stories all the time of like, oh, this person. I, I saw one in California. That these two guys got into an accident on the freeway. One guy beat the other dude to death with a fucking bat and then got ran over by a car. Oh, my so like, God. I'm like, oh, this is this is why you All don't because of a failed yeah. blinker or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's it's not that big of a deal anymore. It's, it's, it, if I got a fight, like, it's I'm not out there looking for one. Do you remember the worst there. reason you got no fight for? <laughs> the, the stupidest reason you got no fight? I mean, somebody looked at me funny. Somebody uh-huh. looked at you funny. Well, right? That was, I mean, that's being a college kid, though, way too much testosterone and not knowing any better. And, yeah, I, I got in a lot of fights as a kid. I mean. You probably had to break some stuff up, too, in the clubs, right? Um, yeah, not really. I mean. People are too, having too much fun. Yeah. I, in Santa Barbara, like, a little bit. Um, just because it's just a bunch of college kids out there partying and yeah. being, being dumb. Uh, in Vegas, like. I mean, I didn't work security in Vegas, but everybody's out here to, mo- for the most part, have a good time. You know, you're on vacation. Um, you don't want to ruin your vacation by doing something stupid. So people Also, are... you sat in that line for three hours. <laughs> I didn't. Somebody else did. I'd be, I, know, I, I would be looking to get in a fight if I sat in I line was, for three I hours. I was at so last month, and I saw the line to get in. I was like, who would do this? Uh, it's like so long. I mean, I need to know somebody if I'm going in there because there's no time, one sitting in that I, line. I always tell people it's time value of money. Like, yeah. How, if... If your time spent standing in line is worth, you know, less than a hundred bucks to you, fucking by all means, enjoy yourself. Yeah, just for me, I want to get out service. there. Nah, I don't even need. You can walk up to the front of the line, tip the door guy, get right in. You probably still have to pay cover, but you're not stuck in that line for two hours. And I don't know. For me, that's worth at least a minimum. <laughs> I, I, I'm uh, probably like a hundred bucks is what it's worth to me to not stand in line for. 50 bucks an hour, that's yeah. worth it to not stand there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'd probably pay more, but I thankfully don't have to. You but you pay more to upgrade on a, on, a, on a shitty flight. Yeah. I've so spent I've spent more money on dumber things than not waiting in line. But, like, I want to get in there and I want to oh, go that's party. That's a good question. Dumbest yeah. thing you bought with your winnings besides that truck. <laughs> I love the truck. That was not a dumb purchase. Um, God, what was the dumb thing I bought? <laughs> Or an experience, maybe they didn't live up to the hype. I'm trying to think, I don't really have anything that I look back on like I should have never done that. Like money wise, I don't. That's rare. <laughs> that's yeah. That's a good thing to do. I mean, there's a lot of. I probably shouldn't have done that, but like, nah, I don't. Look, I don't have any regrets with the way I've. I mean, for sure. Well, I, aside from like firing off big in blackjack, that's like really dumb. But how um, big? I, I've lost over a hundred thousand playing blackjack in one in a session. In a session, yeah. <gasps> how many? How many? How much per hand? Like five k a hand? Or? Um, yeah. Uh, it started off small, and then I lost, and I was like, "Fuck this! I'm not losing." And I went to my box, and, and I got up to table max, which was ten k, and then I had uh, split sevens four times against the six. Oh my god! Two doubles, made four seventeens, and the dealer made eighteen. I wanted to vomit. Yeah. That was one of the worst losing sessions I've had at Blackjack. I mean, this was where? At Aria? Aria, or? yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, you know, platinum for life at MGM Properties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that'll give you some. At least, did you get a room out of it that night? I'm sure. I'm sure I did. <laughs> oh, brutal. Okay, so that's that's what helps quit. Yeah. I, no, that, that wasn't even the thing that made me quit, I don't think. It was just a couple. Were there just, any other games that you just like. You were never a big uh, craps guy, or I like I like it all. I play. I mean, I've liked it all. I've played craps, baccarat, <laughs> blackjack, you got the fucking itch, roulette, right? whatever it is. Like you know, for a while it was just fun. It's a price entertainment kind of thing. But there was never you can never win enough money. Yeah, and when you can never win enough money, you're almost guaranteed to lose. What and about I, sports betting? I did some sports betting. Um, I'm not a great sports better, but I'm not like a massive sports betting fish. I would thankfully. But you've been to some events. I mean, I look at your Twitter and like, was that the Super Bowl you're at? Uh, oh, maybe I just saw the wrong photo. I don't know. I've it been was... to a national championship college game. I've been to a bunch of playoff games. Uh, Let's see. Some here. baseball stuff. We got some rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Sure. 
Um, biggest pot you ever won or lost? Your choice. Uh, I lost a really, really, really big pot, and I forget how much it was to Rick Solomon. Rick's beat me in the biggest pots of my life ever, for sure. One was in a private game. One was in uh, Ivy's room. Both were well over a quarter million dollars, for sure. Oof. Uh, I mean, you weren't playing Rick heads up, right? This is like no, this was an arena <laughs> game, but like Rick, Rick don't. I love Rick, but he doesn't give a fuck. He's just gonna get it in there and he's gonna try to win. That's fine. This question comes up on the podcast a lot, and Rick Solomon is the answer, whether it's a win or lost, a lot of the time. Yeah, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the hands in question or not? I remember that uh, he turned a like a four bet pre. He called with like I want to say it was like Jack Seven or something like that. Mm-hmm. And hey, those connect a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> he called my. I bombed the flop. He. Uh, what did you have? I don't remember. <laughs> but I know that he turned a, a gut shot straight, and I had two pair, and we got it all in. <laughs> yeah. And I did not win. Um, and then another one was we were playing in a private game, and it was a fifty-one hundred game, but there were unlimited Holy straddles. Shit, fifty a hundred, you lose a quarter million pot. Well. Here's the thing. It was uncapped buy-in, whatever. So, and it was Rick and David Cho and a couple other people. But it was basically 5,100, 1,000, 3,000. <laughs> Unlimited straddles, and Rick would straddle from anywhere. So, it was minimum 3,000. Oh so, you're gosh. just putting it in. You got two cards, you're putting it in. Um, and we got it in like four ways all in. And Rick just got there. Now, those, those do those feel worse than the blackjack? Hmm. Not as much, no. but it's poker, right? Yeah, it's poker. Blackjack's mm. worse because you're like, I just shouldn't be fucking playing this game. Yeah. Whereas poker, you're like, all right, I'm at least, you know, playing okay, and I just got coolered. Yeah. They suck. They all suck. So how much how much uh, high-stakes poker are you playing these days? Not very much at all. Yeah. Uh, I'll play if the game's right. You know, I have, thankfully, the nice part about being a non-professional poker player is that I can go play in almost any game I want, if I want. You're talking about the politics involved, about getting invites, getting in, that kind mm. of stuff. Yeah. Is there is it a big problem for, like, the uh, – not even so much the better pros, but, like, the the pros who don't give action or they're just not fun to be around? Yeah, they will not get in the games. Yeah. What's, yeah. The, what's the etiquette, though? Like, what do you have to bring to the game to get invited back? Uh, I think you just have to be a person that people are going to want to play with again. Mm. Or you – you know, if you're a 1020 reg and everybody knows you're a 1020 reg and they think you're a miserable person – you're just not going to get a seat. Yeah. Um, I don't play in any of the politics. It's not my game. I don't run it. I show up if they invite me and <laughs> I'll play. You know what I mean? And I think it's, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to get involved with saying whether it's right or wrong or anything like that because it's none no, of my fucking I'll, business. You also want a, fr- a fun friend. Yeah, I, look, too, right? I, I don't want to play in a poker game that I'm fucking miserable at. Like, Even that's if why it's I, super profitable. Yeah. Well, it's part of the reason I don't play very much is that like, Everybody that plays five ten or above in Vegas when the series isn't here is a pro, you know, and they're grinding it out five days a week or more. Yeah, and most of them are miserable people. Yeah, and I want to be miserable in my free time. Like, it doesn't look like you're miserable in your free time. That's trying for sure. not to be, uh, trying not to be, but like they're all very good poker players too. That's mm-hmm. the other thing is like it's not an easy game. Yeah. So why do I want to sit down again and play against a bunch of guys who are very good and play for a living? When I can pick and choose my spots, play slightly higher stakes, and have more fun. Yeah. All right. Worst job you had before poker? We talked about your job before poker. Uh, Did you ever have like a, a terrible teenage job or something? I worked in a skate shop. A skate shop? That yeah. Sound like it wasn't that. that bad, except my boss was a fucking dick. And like, <laughs> how do you fucking dick when you work in a skate shop, right? Like, yeah. Like the boss of a skate shop, in my mind, must be one of the chillest people on earth. Yeah. And it wasn't even a corporate Skate shop it was like a fucking mom, mom and, pop and pop store. And this dude was a <laughs> fucking dick and like wanted everything to be done his way and his way was right. And if you didn't do it that way, like you, you're getting yelled at. I'm sensing you just don't like bosses. No, I really well. don't do well with bosses. <laughs> I'm not an authority figure type of person. Like, I don't know. <laughs> if you weren't doing poker, uh, weren't well, I guess you're not playing poker. But if if you didn't have to be, you know early retired and had to have a real job, what would you be doing? Fuck, I don't know. I'd probably still be in nightlife. I'm good at it. Yeah. But can you can you be the old guy in nightlife? Yeah, I wouldn't even be the old guy. There's lots of people. No, not now. I'm saying, like, oh, could how I, I old mean, is the oldest person in nightlife? No one's hitting 55 and retiring from the nightclub scene. You know what I mean? I mean, there there's some guys that I know that are in their 40s who are still in nightlife. Yeah. And they enjoy it. I mean, 
I'm sure I'm just I coming from personal yeah. experience. I'm 34 and I'm exhausted all the time. So <laughs> you just, it takes a special person. That's for yeah. sure. Like you have to have the mentality uh, for it. And I think that if I didn't like, if I hadn't found like poker wasn't successful for me, I'd still be able to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't enjoy it nearly as much as I do it mm-hmm. did before. Well, yeah, your other house. Plus, I went now. hard too. I mean, I was partying <laughs> like when I started. I was going like six days a week partying. You know, you fit a whole career partying. into a decade. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, people people come out here to drink, and I was a professional for sure. Um, all right, uh, when you have your headphones on at the table, what are you listening to? It's a mix, but mostly just like hood ass gangster rap. Yeah, like what? Give me some names. I won't know any of them, but I mean, <laughs> Lil Wayne, Pusha T, YG, Jay Z, all, all all of it. Uh, I listen to everything though. I listen to country. I listen to metal, rock and roll, some EDM. Although I've grown sick of it from hearing it in a nightclub every night for ten years. That's the thing, like how you can't listen to that in your car, right? That's I mean, I'm sure you're into it, but that's not something no. you put on at the house when it's on no. at work. <laughs> no. It's not. Uh I, it was for a while though. I, I think when when EDM made its big break in Vegas, which was like two thousand ten and eleven, like we were all all about that. Um some people I know still love it. It's just not it reminds me too much of just being in a nightclub. I don't like anything that reminds me of work. (laughs) Uh, Your least favorite thing about the poker world? Right now or just in general? Fuck, that's a toss-up between people who tank forever in spots where they shouldn't and just shady motherfucking people. It's probably the same person. (laughs) No, No, because there's some stand-up guys who just take way too long. There's some great people who take too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just some, like, every day it's a fucking story about somebody scamming their backers or stealing money or doing this and that and, Mm -hmm. like, it's crazy how long that people have let these people operate. Uh, Did you get burned at all? Because, I mean, usually when somebody gets a big score, all the vultures surround them at the, as they walk to the cage. I got Chino'd once for small money mm-hmm. uh, by Chino. I love Chino, though. Oh, you got Chino'd by Chino. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. I was going to say, I don't know if you could use that term unless it was from actually. Yeah, yeah. It was actually Chino. Yeah. Okay. I love Chino, though. So are you at the the end of a long list, then? I'm never getting... It's like 1400 bucks, and I'm never getting it back, and I've written it off a long time ago, and I'm still friendly with Chino. I'm just... It is what it is. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody else has really... I mean, I got burned on a couple sports things, but nothing crazy. You're not a mark. People people are afraid Um, to mess with you, I I think. I certainly hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Don't come find me, please. <laughs> oh, don't test me. <laughs> Leave him alone. Yeah. Uh, who's the best poker player we've never heard of? Because you've played with some, you've played with some cash game guys who are more anonymous. He, right? You're asking the wrong person. Okay, wrong know. question. Yeah, Let's a, move it up. Who's the best person you've never? Heard? I don't know. I don't fucking know anybody. <laughs> All my friends are good. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're prop betting. Any prop bets? I mean, I'll prop anything. I'm, I'm, but do I'm you have sick. any crazy <laughs> prop bet stories? No, not really. I mean, I've been involved in all uh, a few of Dan Bilzerian's prop bets. I fucking mm-hmm. got in action on that stupid McDonald's bet, which I got. I was really pissed about that one. What fuck, the Michael fight, Nori? Yeah, fuck Mike Nori. Right. Okay. The, I, for people who don't know, Michael Nori. I think did he win a bracelet this summer? I don't know. He did. Know. He did something this summer. Um, he had a bet. Was it two years ago? That he could eat a thousand dollars worth of McDonald's food in thirty six hours. I think it was thirty six hours. It was either thirty six or forty eight hours. Right, and the second the bet was made, everyone who heard about it said that's impossible. Right. <laughs> a lot of people said it was impossible. Um, I I went and did a bunch of fuck because I heard there was a lot of money on the line. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went and did a bunch of research because I like prop bets, and I was like, oh, this is completely doable. Um, no, it is. I y- can't. Yes, it is. I How? fucking know. Exa- I'm not telling because I will one day take action on this. You're going to do the bet? Oh, fuck yeah, I'll do it. For the right amount of money, I would 100% do it. Because right. I thought there was actually. There are people some... listening to this who can make this happen. Fuck. So be come careful. On. Come, come, come at me. I see. 36 hours. I there got were you. like some strategy weird things posted on like, oh, Apple, like a bag of apples costs, nah, you know, too it's much money. It's not apples. I'm not saying. I'm just not saying how to do it. Um, Are you like but I told him dipping the bread I and fucking, water? no, because I texted. I wanted to make a bet, and mm-hmm. I, so I texted him like, "Yo, man, like this is how you win. Yeah. Do these things, and the, and you will win." Yeah, and he did not. And he didn't even fucking try to win. And I bet a bunch of money because, like, I told him everything he needed to do. Mm-hmm. So I and you gave I, him the blueprint, and I assumed he was going to listen. Um, 
and then he didn't, and I wagered money on the side, and I got fucking crushed. Yeah, because he ended up eating, of the $1,000, something like $111 or something. Yeah. It, it wasn't much. It wasn't even close. He didn't even try. Yeah. I mean, he really didn't even put in anything. And he looked pretty miserable. After yeah, I mean, because <laughs> well, I think the way he went about it was terrible. I mean, there were, the stipulations were like $60 worth of salads or something like that. Like, you couldn't just, like, leafy green your way through the thing. Oh, yeah, expand the stomach. That makes sense. Um, But he just didn't try and I was kind of pissed about that. I could, I could, I, I still am on the side of impossible. Oh, so I would love to see this bet happen. Yeah. If you, if you, well, someone really wants to come at me with a real prop on this, I will do it for the right amount of money. All right, I'll bet against you. <laughs> Good luck to you. Uh, maybe five hundred. I could see, you know, someone, someone with skills putting down five hundred for sure. All right, we end the podcast the same time, the same way every time, with a question from the random question generator. You ready? I'm ready. Yours is, okay. Was there ever an event in your life that defied explanation? Do you mean other than me getting second in the main event of the World <laughs> Series? I mean, we could trace that back to a reason. Right? Um, fuck, I don't know. Okay, that was so hard. Like, that one you need to be, like, prepared about. You want to do a different one? Sure. What's the silliest fear you have? I have a fear that octopus will conquer the Earth. Okay, is this ba- is this rooted in science or like science fiction? Yeah, they're, no, they're fucking terrifying creatures. Have you seen the videos of them like coming out of the water to snap? No. Google it right and go right now on a okay. YouTube. Let's go and go. Octopus takes a crab, like eats crab. Eats crab. Crab. Okay. There's a video of it. It fucking snatches the fucking thing. They're terrifying. They're really smart. They walk in on yelling up. I don't know. Or octopus steals crab. Which one should we watch? Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. This, this one's one. fucking okay. terrifying. Maybe we should be. This is like this has become a reaction video podcast. <laughs> I've seen it a lot, but the best is Oz. You know the Aussie man commentates. No, I haven't seen that one. But now I'm gonna go out through a three-hour. He com- he commentates this. Oh my god, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Shawnee, there's an octopus eating a crab. <laughs> she just runs up on it like he doesn't have any friends. It just came out of the water. Yes. Why is it on land? Because they do that. They're fucking terrifying. And it's eating the crab hole. That thing is the entire size of its It body. drags it back down to the fucking depths from well, which you, it came. You can't, dr- you can't drown that crab. Oh, it's going to kill it. It kills it. Where, it's gone. There's no Bye, crab. Down no, there. Yeah, well, fuck it. Crab's gone. It's dead. All right. Well, I don't know if I'd be scared of that size octopus. Okay, but there are giant ones. But there are giant ones, right? And there's there's stories in an aquarium that, that uh, they found a bunch of fish were ending up dead in a tank, right? Mm-hmm. And what had happened was the octopus had figured out how to open its tank crawled out in the middle of the night, went to the next tank, ate some fucking fish, and then came back and, like, went back in its own tank. So it's not like they found him in the middle of the floor. and He knew enough to hide his, his theft. Yeah, they're really smart. There's a video, like, there's plenty of videos of them, like, you, mm-hmm. they shut it in a jar, and it figures out how to open the jar and escape. Uh, you might. And they walk on, there's videos of them walking on land for experience. How big do octopuses get, though? I mean, you've heard of giant squid. They're fucking massive. They can be like eight to ten feet, and who knows? And the ocean is big. There's probably more of them than us. Yeah, one day. And (laughs) they regenerate, like, their own (laughs) limbs if you fucking chop them off. They're fucking terrifying. Okay? (laughs) So whenever they're on the fucking menu, calamari, whatever, I'm eating it. Yeah, I'm doing my part to save the world. Okay, I'm no, I'm no longer one thinking this is a silly fear. Time. I think I might be on on board with you. Yeah, thank you. Please, thank you for joining me in the cephalopod <laughs> freedom fight. <laughs> Jay, thank you so much. Oh, for thank being you for on the podcast. Appreciate That's great. It. That's it. That's the show. Thank you once again to Jay Farber, who you can conveniently follow on Twitter at Jay Farber. If you like the show, hit the subscribe button. Do it. It's not a big commitment. Just one episode every two weeks. If you are listening to this on YouTube or on the Card Player website, uh, what are you doing? Go find Poker Stories on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. One fun trick I learned recently is that you can even get your Amazon Echo to play the podcast. All you have to say is, Alexa, play the Poker Stories podcast. Now, was that a helpful tip, or am I just trying to drive up this show's numbers by activating all of my listeners' echoes and echo dots? And what about the people out there who were already listening to the podcast on their echo? Did it just start itself over? 
Frankly, these are the questions that don't need answers. Don't forget to check out the show's archives, and if you leave a rating and a review, let us know about it with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com to get a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening. 